Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar, How to Delegate at Work, brought to you by your Vanderbilt Alumni Association. I'm Kelsey Campbell, and I serve as the Assistant Director for Campus Engagement in the Alumni Relations Office, and we are thrilled to have you join today. We'll give everyone a minute or so to log on. In the meantime, I want to provide you with some details about today's webinar. This webinar will last approximately 45 minutes, and there will be an opportunity for Q&A towards the end of the presentation presentation. Should you have any questions throughout the web webinar, please feel free to submit them in the via the Q&A function. This webinar will be recorded and we are we will add it to our webinar um, website on our Alumni Association career page and we also email you the direct link in the coming days. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker Hallie Crawford. Many of you know Hallie from pre Vanderbilt Alumni Career Offerings and we are excited to have her back to lead today's webinar. Hallie has been a certified career coach, speaker, author, and national career expert since 2002. Her company, Create Your Own Career Path, is headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. She is regularly featured in the media, US News, Forbes, CNN, Money Magazine, WSJ, and has under an undergraduate and graduate degree from Vanderbilt University and the University of Illinois. With over 2,500 success stories, her team of coaches and resume writers help professionals find jobs that make them want to jump out of bed in the morning to go to work. And with that, I'll turn it over to Hallie. Thank you, Kelsey. I understand it for a second there. You were like, wait, is this what I'm supposed to be saying? So thanks for that great introduction. Um, and thank you, Doug and Kate as well for um, being in the background and helping us facilitate today. Really appreciate your time, especially on what may be your lunch hour, to talk about a really important topic. It's critically important for, I would say, all of us to know and understand how to delegate at work, even honestly, if you're not in a managing other people or management level position. Obviously, it's critically important in that case. But to be able to communicate even with your coworkers about the splitting up of tasks, you know, whose role is, who's responsible for what based on their role, et cetera, um, this idea of delegating and being able to ask for help in the right way is just critically important to professional success, regardless of where you are in your career. So the advice we're going to give you today will go kind of across the board, just FYI. So already had a great introduction. Thank you for that. Um, I've been coaching and training since 2002. Um, getting a lot more gray hair up here at the beginning. It was more underneath. Um, and I'm a proud Vandy um, alum from 95. The advice we're going to give you today is advice that we give to all of our clients. But one of the things I wanted to say kind of up front here is that because we're going to give you a lot of different advice and tips and suggestions, I recommend that you pick and choose what makes the most sense for you to be working on first based on where you are in your journey of learning how to delegate. And then remember, you can get a copy of the slides. It's in the chat box, so you can click on that and download them anytime during the presentation or afterwards. And you'll also get the recording. So anything else that you wanna pick up on to try to practice with next, you can do so from that. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. Discuss first why delegation is so important. And, you know, when I was thinking about this and um, preparing this morning, I was like, I honestly feel like some of these things could go um, or be relevant for our personal lives in some ways. Well, so I do honestly think I could be better at like delegating things to my teenage son, whole different ball of wax. But we'll talk about the importance of it in general. Next, the obstacles that people tend to have to delegating? Why don't they do it in the first place? What are their concerns, et cetera, that prevent them from being effective with this? When and how to delegate? And then we'll give you action steps along the way, but we'd really love it and if, if the very end, while we're working on and getting towards our Q&A portion, um, if you would write down and take away one action step from today, that you will take on in the next week so that you walk away with something really tangible and practical. Um, please feel free, just by the way, to put any comments or questions or even resources that um, you have used in the past for delegation inside of the Q&A box. I'm happy to answer those as we progress and pause for a minute 
no problem there. And we'd love to hear what your success stories are with delegation and any other tips and thoughts that you might have so that we can all learn from each other. All right. So let's talk first about why delegation is so critically important and a little bit about like what the definition is, so to speak. So here's the deal. Obviously, delegation is, you know, giving um, or redirecting, if you will, lots of different ways to think about it, giving or redirecting tasks to other people on your team, whether you manage them or you're, they're your coworkers or you're asking for help in some way, shape or form. Or it could be your friends and family, fam family members, like we said, with our personal lives, too. And the reason why delegation is really important and knowing how to do it effectively is important, as well as knowing when it's good to not delegate as well, is because it's a better distribution of responsibilities across multiple people. Um, it's also important to delegate because sometimes, and it's okay to admit this for yourself as a professional, sometimes someone else is going to be stronger or better at that particular task based on what their strengths or their skill set is. And by the way, what's cool is when they're able to leverage that strength, that boosts their confidence. It's good for their professional development as well. So it kind of goes across the board in a good way. It helps get other people involved in understanding a project, working on a project, like helping them learn and grow as a person and professional. And if nothing else, too, it helps get their buy-in and understanding of what's going on, even if they have a smaller role to play within that project. Sometimes you want them to be involved for these other reasons, too. And finally, for yourself, it will help you and with just personal productivity. You'll be more productive as a result because too many people, I think, and I understand this because I have been this way in the past too sometimes where it's like, well, I'm the only one that really knows how to do this or I'm the best person to do this or I'm afraid if I delegate something to someone else that things are going to fall apart. And this is part of the obstacles that we want to help you overcome, which we'll start on this next slide. So, um, let's talk about this first one. And it looks like we've got someone who in the Q&A already said something, which is great. Thank you for this share. I rely on five team members who do not report to me, but you de I depend on them to hit my number. What are some of the best practices to drive ownership and accountability? FYI, I've given them feedback and even escalated to their bosses. Okay, so um, let's answer this just real quick. And then we'll go back to um, why to delegate a little bit more too. So one of the things that I would consider, um, and thank you for asking this question, is I would be thinking about what these people's strengths are, what their motivations are, and what their values are too. And also, as we talk through um, different ways to drive ownership and accountability today, whether it's getting them involved in something else that helps them understand the project, whether it's giving them more specific deadlines or shorter or longer deadlines, those could be some of the things that I would recommend. So please ask more as we go today too, um, but hopefully that helps you as a starting point. So part of the delegation and why it's so important to do so is statistics always show that people who delegate get and generate higher revenue. It's just they're more productive, they're less overwhelmed, and the other cool things about this is it's not just about you. As we said a moment ago, when you delegate to someone else, in an ideal world, we know it's not always going to be perfect, it can inherently empower that other person because you're giving them some responsibility and it helps kind of boost their confidence or it can do so. It can boost morale because as a result, they feel involved, they feel motivated, they feel part of the team, et cetera. And then finally, like we said already, it increases or can increase your productivity. Now, some of the obstacles that we hear from our clients to effective delegation are listed on this next slide. And what I would like for you to do, please, is write down which of the obstacle applies most to you. Because the first thing that we usually need to do when we're trying to accomplish or achieve a new goal is to also understand what gets in the way of us achieving this goal. Because we can just try as hard as we want to, but if that obstacle is still a sticking point, we're never going to get anywhere. 
So some people think, and I understand this, that it would take longer to explain something than complete it yourself. And I get that. And this is one of the criteria that you want to ask yourself, would it make more sense for me to complete this? Because we're in a time crunch. I really know what you know. we need to do here. It's not going to take me that long. This is my area of expertise. Or can you say to yourself, look, even though it's going to take a little bit of time to explain this, I can figure out how to do so in the most effective way. Is it preparing a video for that person? Is it preparing instructions? And at the end of the day, is it better to do that? Because then that person can take that on on a recurring basis. This is the balance we have to sort out. Some people will tell us their obstacle is they like that sense of being indispensable. Like we had a client once who was actually a CEO of a large company in Chicago, and he actually liked being the problem solver and the firefighter. It was like, okay, I feel like I'm being productive and effective. We had to get him out of that because his corporate culture was never going to allow him to retire or do anything else or pass the baton to someone else to lead the company. So we had to get him out of that firefighting mode, even though he enjoyed it, and find ways for him to feel rewarded and satisfied by learning or teaching, mentoring, et cetera, um, and pushing back on people and saying, I need you to figure that out for me right now. I'm in the middle of something else and get reward out of seeing them grow. He was able to turn his culture around and therefore empower his other people. Sometimes we avoid delegating because we enjoy completing certain, ta certain tasks and we want you to complete tasks or work on things that you enjoy. Maybe you can say to yourself, I'm going to split the difference here and realize that it's not always about the enjoyment. It's also about the best use of your time. Another obstacle people feel is they might feel guilty about adding to other people's plates. They might lack confidence, and this speaks to the question we had a moment ago and who they need to delegate to. And if that's the issue, we need to be thinking about, okay, different ways that we can delegate to them, but also maybe are those the right people on my team and do I need to get outside help if what you've been doing isn't working? And then finally, in some cases, people will say, and I get this because I've felt the same way too, um, and I've had to learn to be a better delegator is you might believe that you're the only one that can do the task or work on the project correctly. So we'd love to have you complete this first poll here now that you've thought a little bit about what your obstacles might be. So if we can launch the first poll, that would be great. And just pick which of the ones you think most applies to you. It's okay if on your list you have a few different obstacles. We can have you work on multiple different obstacles. Pick the biggest one for now, and let's start to tackle that one first. Is it this idea that it's too time consuming? Is it I get anxious because I don't wanna tell other people what to do or have them feel like that's what I'm doing? Or is it the, I'm not sure how to delegate effectively in the right way? And totally okay when you're answering this because obviously that's why we're here. Um, okay, so I did want to point out while you're completing the poll, great comment in the Q&A. Thank you for sharing this. Um, I do have not heard of the Eisenhower Matrix. Um, so if anyone wants to find that and Google it online and maybe put the link in there, that's really interesting. Um, and uh, agreeing about why to delegate, it's important to be able to let go. It develops your team members, all of that. Great comment in the Q&A box there for you guys to check out. So I'll give you a second to complete the poll. And once we have a critical mass, I think we'll share the results too. It doesn't have to be 100%. But I am curious what this will be. Awesome. Aha, okay. So this is really interesting. It kind of changes depending on um, the different webinars, people have different answers. Um, the time consuming is the biggest one, which I totally get. So for those of you who fall into that bucket, I understand it. And what I'll tell you is what I have found is that when I take, it may be extra time sometime, like uh, during the course of my work week, or even a little bit on the weekends to get better with the efficiency and the process of being able to delegate things to other people, whether it's you know, coming up with the right way to um, educate people about certain things, having a project task 
manager, et cetera, it's going to be worth it in the long run. So try to think at the long game versus the short term pain, so to speak of, okay, it's going to take that extra time. There are ways that you can like create a manual for certain things that you can then kind of not have to reinvent the wheel. Some people get anxious about it, totally normal and understandable. You're not alone and not knowing how to delegate effectively. That makes perfect sense too. So you're in the right place. Please, as we go, as you have so far, ask additional questions for your specific situation as needed as we progress. So with this first obstacle, we're going to give you some advice on how to delegate with each of these. So first of all, if you think it's going to take too long to explain, then just to complete it yourself, these are the questions we want you to ask yourself before you just fall into that old habit and do it yourself. Is this the best use of my time? Based on what you're getting paid for, um, based on what your role is, et cetera, is this the best use or really should someone else be doing it? The second question to ask yourself is, will it really take that long to explain? And actually estimate the time because in some cases, when we think about it and we walk through like, oh, this explanation isn't that bad, we realize that it could be shorter than we thought it would be in the first place. We're making some assumptions in some cases. Is there someone else who could explain this? Is it maybe not the best use of your time to not just delegate, but even explain it? Is there someone else you could ask? Because that could help them grow and develop their like mentor, et cetera, types of skills. Or is there a video or a class they could take if this is a bigger kind of issue? And then finally, ask yourself, okay, what's the long-term goal here? Am, am I the person that should be doing this in the long run and always am going to have to do this and I am supposed to or should be? Or at the end of the day, really, I need to be able to offload this so I can get to these other things that really only I can do and that's what I'm getting paid for. So this is kind of your litmus test if you want to print it out and put it on your desk to ask yourself really quickly to help you make a decision about what you should be doing on a case-by-case -case basis, if you will. With the second one, um, our second obstacle is whatever prevents you from delegating, if it's this firefighting concept, like we said, which we, to we totally understand, and I get that way too. Like, I feel like sometimes I'm too drawn, for example, to my emails first and during the course of my day, because it's like, okay, cool, I completed something. It's quick and easy to complete. And it gives me that sense of satisfaction that I've accomplished something versus something that's going to take longer, but could actually be more beneficial to the business in the end. So if this firefighting thing is the case for you, think about where else can you find satisfaction from your work, seeing others grow, working on other tasks that you haven't been able to yet. Is it handling strategy and big picture tasks that really you're supposed to be working on as the type of job that you're in? Is there a way that you can balance the two and say, for example, okay, I'm going to allow myself like, you know, 30 minutes of firefighting a day or whatever it is, however you want to see it. And then finally thinking about where is your true value for your organization and thinking about your own personal and professional values and how those can be honored in a different way leveraging or working on the tasks that you're really supposed to be working on. And with the third one, enjoying completing certain tasks, is there a chance that you can still complete some of these, but part of the time, delegate part of the project, but not all of it, or part of the task, but not all of it. Maybe you can split it up kind of half and half. So remember too, don't like get into this black and white thinking about, well, it's either this or this. Is there a way in some cases you could delegate a portion of things slowly over time and those parts would be a little bit easier to explain? And then at the end of a couple of weeks or a month or whatever, they've been able to then adapt or adopt all of the work. Feeling guilty about adding to others' plates, like if you feel a little bit anxious about this, you need to remind yourself what their role is and could it be good for them to do this, their growth and learning? Are you actually, in some cases, hindering their growth by not delegating to them? Could you enhance their motivation by doing so? Remember that, and we're going to talk about this as we progress, but the right way to delegate will help you um, overcome this anxiety and concern about adding to their plate. We don't want to just dump things on people. It's about handling it in the right way, which we'll talk about. And then if you feel like you lack confidence in those people you need to delegate to, 
I would do a quick assessment of the situation. Okay, what have you done so far that has or has not worked with them? Are you making assumptions that they're even capable of doing this work, that they're not even going to care about it or not be motivated to it, or maybe they don't have a, the strength in it? Do they need training in order to do the task first? How can you address this with them in the right way? Are they the right fit for that particular job or role? And in some cases, are you asking too much? And if you're not, we can talk about these other things that you can do, like deadlines, et cetera, um, as we were talking about a second ago. And great link inside of the Q&A box. So everybody check that out. Thank you for sharing that. So when and how to delegate, let's talk about this next step a little bit more. And part of what you want to do here first, as we've been talking about so far, is getting clear about if the situation, the project or task, if it really needs to be delegated and if it would be a good idea for both parties involved because it empowers the other person or can empower them to learn something new. Usually when you delegate something, something to someone else, and this is not always the case, I realize, but in a lot of cases, in an ideal world, when you do delegate something to someone else, it does encourage them or can encourage them to take responsibility because you're giving them something and not just like preventing them from doing so. In an ideal world, it can help people learn how to overcome challenges, deal with situations directly and learn how to figure things out on their own or develop a strength that they may not already have. And as we said, higher personal productivity. If the person is not quite ready for the responsibility or if they're not taking it on in an effective way and things aren't happening, do you need to establish checkpoints along the way versus just handing everything over to them and assuming it's going to happen? Making sure that they know how to do it, how to prioritize their time, et cetera, and if you've tried multiple other things, do you need to say, look, we're going to have a check-in call every week for five minutes just to see where you're at? The thing about this delegation concept and when you try different things is it teaches you to, depending on how the person responds to the different things that you're recommending and trying out, can give you an inkling about what may be going on with them if they're not stepping up to the plate. And then having a more open, direct conversation with them about what's not happening happening, and why is going to be really important too. So we encourage that and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we progress today as well. So um, when we're thinking about when and how to delegate, these are some of the other things that you want to be thinking about. Is this solely my expertise and literally no one else knows how to do this? Then you need to do it. If the expertise that you have is something that um, you could teach someone else and it's worth doing so, you could consider that. But you really always have to ask yourself, is this my area of expertise and I'm really the only one that can do this? Again, what's the best use of my time? And like we said a moment ago, could I maybe start this out, put some framework around it and some suggestions and kind of guideposts? Um, along the way for when they know that they're being effective and what the milestones are, and then I can hand it off at that point. So as we said a moment ago, there's different ways to like um, kind of split the task in half or start it on your own, but give people a little bit more structure to how they know that they're being successful. Another question is, do I have time to effectively delegate this, this task, including training the person? and reviewing the work when it's completed. So this is the tough thing too about delegation is that as we all know, when you bring or like start this, it's not just about training at the beginning, but you either have to evaluate the work yourself at the end or check in with them on a regular basis too. So when you're estimating your time and the time required, make sure it's not just that time up front but what am I going to do until I feel comfortable with them handling this on their own? And how much time would be required to do all of that, okay? I would leverage AI in some of these instances. If you feel like you need help, for example, delegating um, a certain type of project that you're having trouble delegating with someone. 
if you're if you need help with you know establishing the milestones etc this is a good place that you can leverage chat gpt to get some more ideas on how do i do this like how do i structure it for this other person what's a project plan that i could create another question to ask yourself is on this next slide will this be a recurring task because recurring tasks especially if they're not just within your area of expertise and if they are a little bit more like administrative and rote and routine that should be delegated in a lot of cases to someone else again depending on the roles that are played etc but when something is recurring if it's not really something that is solely your expertise we need to be thinking about who else could help this with me or for me and then finally, is this a task like an opportunity for a coworker or a team member or someone that you manage to grow and develop their skills? So if you are in a leadership position, or even if you are just kind of into and have an interest in like mentoring or being a good um, teammate and helping your teammates learn and grow, you also don't want to think just about yourself with this. So it's kind of like, don't be selfish, for lack of a better way to say it, and think about, you know what, this is something that would really benefit so-and-so in order to um, help them learn something new or grow or get better at their job. So also think about other people in order to consider and decide when it's appropriate to delegate to someone. Um, We've got another comment here, and then I'll deal with the, the next question closer to the end, as you indicated too. Um, someone said, I read that immediately checking your email first thing in the morning actually contributes to inefficiency. I've heard that too. Um, so often emails are to what others want versus what is your priority. So it pulls you off task. Um, completing prioritized tasks first, then checking email. I absolutely love this. My only little addition to this, so check out in the Q&A box, this is great advice too, would be some people are in the type of job or need to first thing in the morning, and if you can really stick to it, just scan for any like fires they may need to put out. Like if they need to reprioritize their, prioritize their priorities for the day. But outside of that, I highly recommend waiting until you get your other stuff done, absolutely. So when you're thinking about delegation, the next thing we want you to be considering are what are other people's strengths? And if you don't know what other people's strengths or personality types are within your team, it's a good idea to start considering that and thinking about it so that you know who to delegate to, when it's the right time to do so, and if they are the right fit for what you're asking for. The next thing that you can consider is, does it align with their goals? So do you have at least a little bit of a sense of what motivates them? Because people, obviously, when they're not motivated to do something, they're much less likely to do it or do it effectively and properly. Because if you play to other people's strengths and really try to keep that in mind overall, they will be more motivated, they'll be more successful, and you won't be asking people to do something that they really either just don't know how to do, or if they could do it or figure it out, if it doesn't play to their strengths, they're just not going to, it's not, the end work product is not going to be as good. Now, I realize that in an ideal world, we can't always play to everybody's strengths. Like our job description is our job description and we have to complete the job. And I get that. What we're asking is for you to just consider these things as often as possible within reason when you're considering and thinking about this idea of delegating. Okay. Now, how to delegate. Let's talk about this a little bit more and kind of some of the structure here. So first of all, when you decide to delegate to someone else, it's really important to make sure that you define the desired outcome and very clearly. And I realize that this may seem obvious, but I can't tell you how many times I'm in a rush to ask our operations person to help me with something and she has to write me back and says, okay, so wait, why are we doing this? And why did this come up? So spend a few extra minutes making sure on this next slide that you're providing as much context as needed so that this person understands why we're doing this, what the purpose is, what the goal is, what it looks like, and even numbers and statistics if appropriate. Now, you may not have to provide all of this information every single time. But what I find is that 
if I'm asking one of my team members to do something, when I provide that why in that context, they're much more able to help me get that project completed in a way that I actually want because they understand the thinking behind it and they might have a completely a new, better idea on how to tackle things when I give them that context versus just saying, go do this and do it in this way. It's a really good idea to clearly tie the project or the task to the organization's goals as much as possible. Um, and sometimes we do these webinars for like family too. And I use these some of these tools with, with my family as well. So that's why we put that in there. As much as possible, you want people to feel like they're moving the ball forward as it relates to the organization's mission and goals. They're a part of a team. They believe in what they're doing. Those types of things are important as part of being motivated to complete a task. You want to make sure that you've got a defined deadline. And if the person that you're delegating to is not great at time management, you may need to put those milestones along the way. So interim deadlines so that they know that they're making progress and what they need to complete at any point. And then finally, a very clear sense of how are they going to know it's completed and how are they going to know it's completed properly. And here's what I find is even if you end up needing to delegate multiple different types of projects, if you and once you get better at creating like a project plan, so to speak, and a way to delegate for one project, you're developing that muscle. And you're going to get better at doing so with other ones, even if they're a little bit different, because you've started to develop a framework that you can plug and play a little bit more. OK, so just know, too, that remember, it takes about 90 days typically to develop a new habit in the right way and have it be a little bit more root and routine for you. So this delegating thing, the more you practice and do it, the actually better you'll get at doing so over time. And you'll learn how to make adjustments um, as the time allows and is needed. The next thing you need to think about when you're delegating is ensuring that you're providing or your organization or someone is providing the resources that this person needs in order to complete this task. Do they need additional training? Do they have the computer software that they need? Whatever it is. So make sure that they've got what they need in order to make it happen. Every once in a while, that will happen to me where I'm like, oh, OK, so we need to buy this you know, different thing or whatever it is. Step number two or part of providing the resources is I think it's really important, depending on the person that you are delegating to, that you may need to micromanage or not based on their skill set and where are they are with understanding how to perform this task or work on this project. In an ideal world, we're not micromanaging because you want to give them just enough rain to let them figure things out on their own and force them to do so so that they're learning and figuring it out versus you having to answer every single question. That's not helpful at all. So you need to be able to, like I actually had someone once and this is just one idea, but who would tell me as a leader, um, he didn't always respond to his staff's emails right away, unless obviously it was an emergency or something like that. He would wait until at least the next day, give or take, because nine times out of 10, if he did that, they would go and figure it out on their own. And it was a win-win situation. So remember too, that in some cases, some people may default to asking you questions and there are ways sometimes, and it might be a good thing, and I hate to say it this way, but that it's good that you're unavailable or make yourself unavailable or, you know, let them know, I need you to figure this out because I'm in the middle of this other thing. Can you, you know, can we talk about it tomorrow? And then finally, with the resources question, you want to make sure that you help address any gaps between their skill set and the outcome that's required. So help them along the way if needed provide some structure, training, classes. We've talked about all of that already. So just make sure that you're matching it up in the right way with the right person. Make sure too, as part of delegating, you're establishing a really good, effective communication channel. So when and how you might want them to report into you, whether it's email, phone, and how frequent you think that is going to be needed for the project. And you could always change it if needed. 
um, what your expectations are for the project and ask them what their expectations are. Because it's really interesting to me how some people will feel like maybe they've articulated a goal really well or their expectations, but if they have the other person report it back, they realize, oh, they didn't get it. So think about the updates, think about the milestones, and we'll go ahead if we could launch our second poll here about regularly establishing expectations when you do delegate. Um, we'll ask you about that in this next poll. Make sure that you either have an open door policy for questions, whether it's email, phone, et cetera, or you do not, like we just said a moment ago, what's going to be the most effective way to handle this. And you're going to know at the end of the day, who are the people that tend to come back to you and ask questions versus those people who try to figure it out on their own and maybe do a good job with that. Or some people may try to figure it out on their own and they actually don't do a good job. So you may want to check in on them a little bit more. It's all about what kind of like um, rain or free rain you want to give them when we're thinking about this. So I'm going to move to the next slide while we're finishing this next poll so you can take a look at our next concept here about um, allowing for errors and differences because this is always going to happen inevitably. Nobody's perfect. And I'm really curious what these are. Okay, good. So it looks like the majority of people feel like that's the case. Remember, context, context, context. I like to over-communicate always versus under-communicate. And for those of you who are saying no, room for growth, that's why you're here. So the other thing, if we take a look at this next slide that you want to think about with delegation, is you always want to expect, and I don't want to say expect them to fail because that sounds terrible, but allow for errors and differences. like. When, what are you going to do when that comes up? Um, be ready to or open to them providing maybe an alternative solution to what you've suggested just in case and don't assume that their way is wrong, okay? So what are you going to do uh, also with um, giving them just enough rope not to hang themselves with, right, but to be able to experiment a little bit and up front when you delegate the project, talk right then about how you're going to handle feedback in both ways. So if things aren't going as well as you would like or I would like, how are we going to handle this? We need to have a quick conversation over the phone about it. Okay? Okay. So design the relationship or how you're going to manage disagreements, errors, difficulties up front. So what's going to happen or what should we do if this deadline is missed? What do you recommend or what will you commit to doing? Deliver it constructively when you do have to deliver that feedback, especially if it's difficult. What we like for people to say is, hey, I need to talk with you about something per our agreement. We said we'd be open about feedback. Um, is this an okay time to talk with you about this right now? That asking permission can help kind of drop their defenses a little bit, lets them know what's coming. But again, if you've got an agreement, you're pointing to that over there and you're saying this is what we decided we would do. Um, in this instance, if there was a mistake or an issue. Two other things as part of delegating that we would recommend is being patient. I know that can be hard. They might take longer than you would. They might do things differently than you would. You need to just be open to that and ready for differences. Come up with a project timeline together. Don't just always say, this is the deadline, but check in with them about it. Like, is that reasonable for you? Because what if someone else gave them five other things and you don't know about it? So it's not to say that you're going to let them run the show, but have a conversation about the deadlines. And if you feel like they're not going to be on time, give them a deadline of a week earlier so that you've got that buffer zone. And if needed, help them with time management. After action reviews are great. So once the project is done, review what happened. Give them credit and kudos where it's due, what went well. What didn't go well? What can we do differently next time? This You need to have these conversations with people so that you can, again, establish open lines of communication and know what to do differently the next time around. And you're not just beating your head against the wall doing the same thing. Okay. And then when you're providing feedback, we talked a second ago about asking permission, um, creating that agreement up front. Remember that the effective assertive communication formula, if you will, when you are giving feedback to someone, 
is always, and this is really interesting, is to show understanding first, then state the facts, then work on coming up with a resolution, offer one up, but ask them for one as well. You might even want to ask them to offer up a, a resolution first to see what they come up with and force them for greater accountability. The reason why the show understanding is there is not because you're going to let them off the hook because they missed the deadline. It's not because you're going to agree with everything they say, but to at least say, I understand this may be a little bit more difficult or maybe, you know, the time management is an issue. Let's talk about this. Here's what happened. Let me know where you're coming from with this, because there may be something that is going on with them that you don't know. Um, and it could be something that you can address together. Now, a few tools for delegating. We'll go to our um, last agenda item and then we'll get to Q&A here. We really like this coaching tool that we teach our clients about called powerful questions. And powerful questions are things that you can ask people that you are delegating to, to try to force them more so to take responsibility, come up with their own answers, and not just like shy away or shirk something. Powerful questions, bottom line, listed on this slide are open-ended, they do not allow for a yes or no answer, and they assume a positive outcome, and that's why we really like them. There are some examples on this slide. What could or would you do differently going forward? What would accomplishing this project effectively look like for you? What would be the best outcome? Powerful open-ended questions like this will force the other people, the other person or people to come up with their own answers. In some cases, take greater responsibility or accountability for what they're doing. And you're not just shoving things down their throat without getting some understanding. And what I like about these two is that, like we said, they assume a positive outcome. It's like, what would you do differently? And how are we going to know things are better? Not if we know they're better. Okay. So try these out. They can make a really big difference. The other cool thing about powerful questions is they tend to be a little bit more or come across a little bit more as trying to gain empathy and understanding. So if someone is becoming a little bit defensive, it tends to help drop those defenses a little bit more. Then you can go in and say, here's what I think we need to do. Here are my recommendations. So again, it's not saying that you just roll over and let them run the show but you've framed this out in a more productive way, conversation-wise, to then get to those parts of like, let's come up with an agreement together and what we're gonna do about it if the agreement is not met, okay? So we talked about the providing feedback a little bit more. I really want you to focus on this. And with our last poll here, if we could launch that now, that would be great. We're curious about how many people out there regularly provide feedback to the people that you work with or people that work for you, because we know this tends to be something that can be a little bit touchy for people, me included. I tend to avoid it. It's a normal human response, but we have to get better at kind of designing our professional relationships so that we have agreements around how we're going to deal with these touchy things so that they are smoother, more effective, and it meets everyone's needs, but also like their communication style a little bit more as well. And part of why I say all of this, and then I'm just going to go to the next slide while you're completing the poll, is um, some people, for example, who are more introverted, they prefer to get feedback via email first, sit with it overnight, and then they can talk about it. Some people who have a different personality style or type or whatever yours is may not match what theirs is. So in order to communicate effectively, it is good to try as much as you possibly can to have the other person hear you in the right way. Okay, good. Most people are giving that feedback, which I love. This is another tool, and then we'll start to move to our Q&A. So please put any other comments or questions um, in the Q&A box. These are the four needs of followers that the Gallup organization, which is the Gallup poll and the StrengthsFinder assessment, assert that people who work for organizations, you included all the way up to the CEO, what their needs are. Four needs of followers is what they call them. Trust, compassion, stability, and hope. Sometimes when we are having trouble either 
um, being an effective delegator or if the people that we've delegated to are not or are having trouble completing the tasks, it could be a breakdown in one of these possible areas. So we suggest that you use this tool and the link to the slides, remember, is in the chat and it's here too, that you can use this tool in many different instances. If you're having a conflict or an issue with someone else, is there a breakdown in one of these areas that if you worked on that a little bit more together, things could get better? To notice and pay attention to if your needs are being met within your organization and to consider in some cases if the other person that you're trying to delegate to or work with, if their needs are not being met in some way, and these need to be beefed up. This does not mean that this is your sole responsibility to provide all of these things. But when we give this to our clients, nine times out of 10, they're like, oh, I get what's going on between me and this other person. And I think we need to work on one of these areas. Okay, so something to print out, put on your desk because it can help you with your own professional growth and development and your needs, but also to notice what may be going on with a, a team between two people that you're delegating to within um, other parts of your organization as well. And our final tool, and then we'll get to our Q&A, is um, one of the books, in addition to the resource that was mentioned in the Q&A box, which thank you for sharing that, I'm going to check that out too, is there are five levels of delegation from this book, Free to Focus. This is a really helpful book about um, delegation and how to handle things. So level one for someone that you're delegating to is carrying out instructions, obviously. Level two is research and reporting. Level three is research and recommending. Okay. Level four, decide and inform. Level five, acts independently. So when you're thinking about delegating to someone or someone that you've already delegated to and maybe it's not going as well as it could, what level are they at in terms of you delegating this information to them? Are they still in just, I'm just going to do exactly what you tell me? You need to move them up into these different levels and areas. Okay. All right. So we've got some great comments and questions in here. I just wanted to put this up here. So that another way to get the slides, if you want to use your phone, we always offer a discount to a um, Vandy alum. If you'd like to learn more about our coaching services, the QR code here is for you to set up a quick consult with me to learn more about our services and find out if they're a good fit for you. So if you would, while we go through these questions, write down one action step that you will take in the next week. That would be fantastic. Here are some ideas on the next slide, um, and then I'll pull up the one from right before. Um, and let's talk about, as a manager, two questions here. As a manager, there's always a balance between strategy, innovation, execution, et cetera, and investing time into developing other people. Absolutely. How much focus does delegation deserve in this mix on average? Thank you for asking this question. I will be honest with you, I don't have an exact perfect number. I think it depends on a lot of different factors, what level of growth and engagement your team is at, what type of job you're in, these other types of things. So I think it really depends on your role um, and where your team is at kind of in these different levels of delegation. But if I had to say and like um, estimate a number, to me, as a manager, it at least needs to be like, I want to say 40%, um, at least that, and get to closer to like 50 or 60%. Again, depends on your role, your team, et cetera. But those are going to be the numbers that I'm going to throw out to move in that direction um, as a starting point. Um, we'd love to see as we answer this next question um, to um, any of your action items as well. Um, time permitting challenge when you delegate to people who aren't prioritizing or not meeting the deadline and they're they're not good at um, focusing, et cetera. So hopefully um, some of the tools that we came up with, um, Andrew, for your question or talked about like having that conversation with them about what are you going to do if they miss the deadline and asking them to come up with um, some suggestions there so that you're not having to babysit them. Maybe you are a little bit at the beginning, but getting them to take a little bit more responsibility. I would try those things and I would try this idea of powerful questions 
to have a frank conversation and direct conversation with them about, look, this is the way it's been. It can't continue to be this way. What's going on? What do we need to do differently? Like, talk to me. Like, I think you need to have a, a, a hopefully a deeper, more open conversation with them if they will do that with you. And another person asked, and let me go to this next slide too, because I promised I would do that um, for the consult and then the slides too. The powerful questions, again, um, they can be anything related to the situation that you're asking about. So remember, they're not yes or no, they're open-ended. What would accomplishing this project look like in your opinion? Um, what would be the most motivating part of this task for you? So they can either be um, information gathering where you're trying to gather information about whether they're understanding the task um, or they can be just very open ended. Um, how will you know that you've accomplished this goal here? What is a different way for you to work towards or work on this project? So grab the slides if you want the specific ones, because I honestly don't remember exactly what they were. Um, and also in the um, chat box, too, is a way to schedule a consult with us. When you do that, please remind me that you heard about us on um, a Vandy webinar um, so I can give you that coupon code for our services. Um, and Kelsey, is there anything we want to say while we're waiting for more questions? Um, any announcements that you want to make or anything else too? I want to give people time to think. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for all this information today. I found it beneficial and I'm so excited to have all of it. Um, and also just thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, we will be putting a post event survey in the chat, um, that we would love for you to complete and just tell us how, um, your experience was today. We will also include today's webinar recording in a follow-up email. Um, and as Hallie said, we encourage you to schedule a free consultant call for any additional assistance. That link is in the chat, also on the screen right now. Um, also, be sure to save the date for our networking night. That will be the 15th. And if you're in the Atlanta area, be sure to register for our in-person workshop with Hallie on October 11th. We will be learning five tips to get along better with your coworkers, and we hope to see you at these upcoming events. Um, if we have no further questions, we just want to thank you again for attending the webinar, and um, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody, and thanks for the kudos. Have a great one. Good luck.